It looks like the broadcast was deleted on Facebook. What? I don't know what's happening here. Okay, well, I hope we have <laughs> some people watching us. We just had a glitch on Facebook. Um, so Dr. Lester um, might be a little aggravated. I'm not sure what happened there, but welcome um, everyone. And this is being recorded. So if you did are missing it on Facebook, you can catch it again. Um, so if Teresa is tuning in and um, starts getting phone calls. It just told me we had a glitch on Facebook. It, um, StreamYard doesn't want to talk to <laughs> Facebook today. Welcome. Um, welcome to the program, everybody. I am Lily Browning, Dr. Lester's regular co-host, as he um, always <laughs> refers to me as. Um, I missed the last couple of weeks, so his... Um, retribution to me is that he is <laughs> unavailable today. He's actually helping another county um, teach a class. And so I'm going to be running this uh, plant clinic today. Um, so I invited an old friend of mine. Careful now. Careful. <laughs> careful. A long time friend of mine. Much better. <laughs> We've known each other since late last century. <laughs> Thanks, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> Which is absolutely the truth. I think it's November of 99 when we met. Um, this is Jim Mull. He is the, uh, what are you? Why don't you tell us what you are, Jim? <laughs> I am, I'm here in Pasco County. I'm the Master Gardener Volunteer Program Manager. And Lily, I saw a comment that people are having a hard oh, time hearing us yeah oh. Brenda, she she fixed it <laughs> okay good sorry yeah. don't I, i'm not used to this platform so you know yeah. sometimes we push a button and oops exactly so. yes um brenda's one of our regulars and she is a master gardener here in hernando so okay we welcome her and welcome everyone else who has come to visit us today um while we're getting started and like I said, I apologize if anyone is trying to get in via Facebook. I just got some kind of odd message that told me Facebook and StreamYard do not wish to play with each other today. So I'm going to see if I can start um, to share something with all of you. Let's see if it's going to work. I Oh no, it's not there. But <laughs> of course, as we're going live, things don't actually want to be around. Oh, let's try this again. Share, share, share screen, share screen, window. There we go. Okay, can you see that, Jim? Yep, I can see the PowerPoint, but you got to get it Yep, into slide yeah. mode. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. So I made a really pretty PowerPoint. So we want to share this today. And there have been some questions that have come in to Dr. Lester via his email. We're going to address those. But since he's putting me in charge today, you know, I got to go over this with you. If you live in Hernando County, and this is just for Hernando, our specific rules. Um, and these are our rules all the time. This is not a short time you know, thing going on. These are our watering restrictions. They are one day a week. Um, you go by your address. If it ends in one, you may water on Mondays before eight or, 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 not and, after six. And this applies to people on private wells as well as on our municipal system. The reason for that is we're all getting our water from the same place, from the aquifer. And that's what we're working on uh, protecting. And here's something, um, Bill and I talk about this all the time, Jim. So okay. instead of them hearing it from us, we're gonna ask you, when it comes to mowing a lawn, how low should you go? 
never drop the blade for some reason is one of the things I try to impress upon people because I've heard every reason why they drop the blade for that usually begins the a lot of problems. It depends on the turf, of course, but most of our warm season grasses like St. Augustine, floor temp is one cultivar or selection of St. Augustine. And our Bahia grasses are mowed at three minimum, four is better uh, all year round. Um, there are some dwarf St. Augustines out there. They're not as common. They can be mowed a little shorter. Um, some of the zoysia is a little bit shorter, but it's closing in on about nearly three inches for empire zoysia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're from the north originally and you're used to mowing at an inch, inch and a half, our warm season grasses will, will hate you for that. And also when you don't have the density of the leaves, weeds will start growing because you're getting sunlight down to the soil surface. So mowing high has a lot of advantages in our wet subtropical climate. The other problem I see is lawnmower blades being uh, really dulled quickly because we have mostly sandy soil and that sand just gets sucked up by the machine and that quickly dulls a blade. And this picture is pretty good. There's some fraying, but not too bad. But if you're seeing mostly frayed edges rather than a clean cut, I don't know. Can they see my mouse moving? Can uh, you see? No, see I can't. Okay, there's one blade right almost smack dab in the middle that has a nice clean cut across. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah, know, you want that to be mostly what you see after you mow. Right here, yes. Yeah, that's where I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And okay. overall, this is pretty good. There's some ragged edges here and there. I mean, that's just part of the nature of, you know, a lawnmower. But I, I've seen it where after it's mowed, instead of being green, it almost has a, kind of a straw color to it. Right. You know, a brownish, a kind of a more on the color of straw. And that's mm -hmm. a real good indicator that it's being, you know, hacked at by the machine and not cut. Okay. So now you've heard it from more than just Bill and I. Mohai, it's imperative to the health of your lawn. All Plant right. them high, too, if it's yeah. shrubs and trees. But there that's another go. story that you'll have to invite me back for. Well, there you go. So let's start with this question uh, from Marlene. Um, she has a problem here with her ginger that she sent uh, me a picture of. What do you think is going on here with her ginger, Bill, and how would you treat it? Well, since I'm Jim, I won't answer for Bill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you can move the cursor kind of into that middle uh, leaf. Yeah, right along there you see kind of black dots and then come a little lower there appears to be a flower spike stem uh yeah right there you see more black dots uh that sure looks like scale insects to me mm -hmm. uh scales uh live scale and dead scale look pretty much the same um the insect could be dead under that cover and if that's the case there's no sense of spraying because dead is dead um, but there's a high-tech test you get your fingernail out and you scrape along the stem or that leaf and if they kind of pop off like dry skin they're dead mm -hmm. but if they ooze a fluid or feel sticky on your on your thumbnail uh, you have live uh, scale and you need to treat um, I would start with something least toxic first is always our motto and extension uh, one of the things I think everyone should have in their arsenal uh, for a pesticide is uh, neem oil uh, okay. It's much more widely available than it was 10 years ago. And oils do a really good job of smothering scales. Uh, so you may have to treat, you know, once or twice uh, to kill them. But again, after the first treatment, give it about a week, see if they're alive or dead. And, you know, whatever the repeat is for the directions on the product you may have to repeat you know a week or 10 days or two weeks out part of that is you know it's hard to kill them a bit and also coverage it can be difficult on on a larger plant with lots of surfaces to 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 get it on there remember these products are are contact they the, the oil have creates a film over the insect and it suffocates them 
Uh, so you have to get a nice coating where they're living. Uh, so if that's on the upper side of the leaves, which sometimes happens, you need to make sure you spray the upper side. But a lot of times insects are on the lower sides of the leaves and a lot of people don't take their wand and you know go upward with the spray. Um, and that's where things can fail. Uh, the other thing I see is that one leaf kind of further up toward the top that's kind of brown and bent over. That that kind of looks like it got sunburned, maybe. Um, okay. I can't really tell from the photo, but that kind of looks somehow it got sunburned. Maybe parts of the plant were pruned out and all of a sudden that which was in the shade is getting a little more sunlight or something. But I, I don't think that's an insect or a disease. Uh, yeah. She did mention that there has been a lot of um, pruning going on. I mean clearing going on in her yard that that'll explain it and um, you know even if it's kind of still shady but it's now getting an hour or two of sun when it didn't get any on there the gingers can sunburn because they're they haven't adapted to a little higher light so that looks like sunburn to me so it doesn't have gingivitis no but that's a good one i'm gonna steal that <laughs> And she also asked about ordering and bringing in uh, ladybugs. Uh, save your money. Uh, augmenting beneficial insects when they're not enclosed, uh, like in a screened in enclosure or uh, a greenhouse, they, they fly away because what they ship to you are adult with wings. Mm -hmm. Usually they're from California and they wanna get back to California pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, so they, they don't stick around. Uh, you have ladybugs in your yard, uh, learn to recognize the immature because they have complete metamorphosis. So they start off as an egg that mom laid, then they hatch out and they're a larva. And the larval form does not look anything like the adult. And a lot of people will kill the larval form because it's bigger, it's faster, it's easier to spot than its prey usually. So they usually go, aha, here's the culprit, mm -hmm. and they don't realize that's the one doing the job. Right. Um, so learning basic uh, entomology of you know what ladybugs look like as an immature is imperative. Plus, ladybugs don't really go after scale that well. Um, there are a lot of teeny tiny little wasps that do. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say the word wasps, please do not panic. They don't make big colonies and go after you. And you saw those B-rated <laughs> B-movies years ago. Um, that's all a bunch of falsehood. Um, very these tiny are parasitic wasps. Very yeah. tiny parasitic. Even if it were to go after you, probably wouldn't even know it. Right. Stung you. They're teeny. <laughs> but they're great for the controlling the scale. They now, work this, well. This one... Um, confounds us. First of all, the slide moved. So um, what it yeah. says is, is this is a question from Sharon and she has this pest on her wisteria. And you and I and Dr. Lester discussed this. We're, both, we're all three a little confounded because our first thought when we look at these is sawfly. They look like sawflies. But you and I had never heard of sawflies on wisteria. Dr. Lester said he did some research and said that there is a certain kind that will eat, what did he say, hibiscus? Hibiscus and a few other ornamentals, but yes. they're not that common. But um, if, if this is the American wisteria, which behaves itself in Florida, yeah, this could do a lot of damage. Now, if it's the Asian one, uh, this is good biological control of a plant that really is weedy in Florida. Um, yes. Uh, I'll assume this is the American one. Um, you could pick those off and drown them in a bucket of soapy water, you know, if they're just that few. Um, if more of them are on the plant than what we see in the photograph, um, I would go with something, a uh, bio rationale like spinosad. Um, mm -hmm. That should do a good job on this. Um, BT won't work because they're not actually caterpillars, correct? Yeah. You know, we don't think these are caterpillars. All three of us saw 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 this and said <laughs> saw flies. Um, yes. But I also scratched my head on the the fact that it was on wisteria. I've not seen that in in my career. But, now, uh, if there are pine trees nearby, I mean, I would say they just kind of fell there, but they do appear to be consuming <laughs> the plant. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm pine sawflies. I don't know of them eating other things other than pine trees. So. Uh, I don't, 
again, this is kind of what, the outlier of what we've mm -hmm. seen. Again, if that's only six or eight caterpillars, pick them off, drown them, squish them. Don't be squeamish, gardeners. And if you're squeamish, put on a pair of gloves. It'll make your life a little less messy to clean up. Um, but okay. yeah, so you have nearly confounded three of us <laughs> with this one. Now this one is pretty easy. This is a question from Louise, and these are her sweet pepper. Um, she sent this to Dr. Lester last night, and um, I have these are her words, but I highlighted. <laughs> A couple of the words. She said she noticed these white leaves have fallen off her mini pepper plants. Upon closer inspector, little inspection, little white things, I highlighted that, began to fly. I highlighted that when I moved the leaves. And this is the third time. And here's what she has used on it. The reason I highlighted these is because horticulturalists are not all that creative. <laughs> So she identified this insect without even realizing it. These are what, Jim? They're white flies. They're and, white flies. Yes. And this is a, a big crop. Uh, this, you know, the number has exploded um, with that kind of feeding damage and looking at the plants looking pretty, pretty worn out. And it's summer and it's not the best time to grow most vegetables i rather than trying to control it which you're not going to probably get under control really well and i don't think those plants will have enough oomph to recover this is the time to be like a professional when things tank on you you rip it out uh throw it away in this case because you don't want to keep it nearby to you know spread to some other plants and then you know replant in the fall which would be about the early part of September with, with fresh new plants. Don't try to nurse some, some of these relatively annual plants back to health if they're attacked that heavily. You know, you're right. just Sometimes spinning you consider How much did you pay for the plant? You don't want to spend five times that much trying to keep the plant alive. It's not, you know, economically efficient. Yeah, the $64 tomato is a book yes. uh, on that. And uh, some people go to the nth degree to get the tomatoes and are doing it at the wrong time. Uh, Lily, I'm just wanting to comment. Somebody said, didn't see on Facebook, it glitched on, on us. Yes, yes. We apologize. So hopefully you found us on whatever platform you're using <laughs> now. Since I'm not used to this, uh, I called it barnyard, but it's what? Streamyard. Stream, streamyard. I'm not used to this. You, you do work pretty close with 4-H, so I can see the barnyard came into your <laughs> into your mind. Now, Dr. Lester was absolutely thrilled with this as one of his regulars, um, the way that she sent this question to him. And let me show you what she managed to do there. Now, can you see that moving? <laughs> moving pictures. He was thrilled to have that in his email. And he sent that to me. And again, like I said, horticulturists are not all that creative, so I said, what is that, a grape leaf skeletonizer? I totally made that up. And guess what that is? <laughs> it's a grape leaf skeletonizer. <laughs> so. uh, but, you know, here's kind of a good thing, you know, monitor your plants. And when you see something that doesn't look quite right, can you get the video to work again? You know, flip the leaves over. Most of us are looking at the top side of the leaves and going, what's wrong? And like I said a little earlier, most insects are on the underside of the leaves and you can see them all clustered. Right now, the easiest way to control it is to cut that leaf off and stomp on those those little buggers. Or, you know, if you want to drown them in soapy water, mm -hmm. um, you know, you may find them on a couple other leaves in a cluster like that since they're so newly hatched. And uh, insect control when they're all congregated in one area is easy. Kind of yeah. like lubber grasshoppers when they first emerge, you kind of do the Mexican hat dance and squish them. <laughs> you know, when they're big and jumping around like at this time of the year, um, you just have to go running around stomping them or pay kids to use them as a pet. Um, this is a link, which I'm not going to click on the link because it messes up my PowerPoint, but you can Google uh, Grape Leaf Skeletonizer UF. 
and you'll find this publication. And I read through it and um, the management, they always tell you the management at the end. Um, basically, they said there's not really any recommended uh, management for it. Just cut it off and, you know, move on, <laughs> you know, with your day. It's not a severe pest. And that's it with those questions. Um, as soon as I stop sharing, I'll get to see what we have in the chat. Um, next week, as I mentioned, Dr. Lester uh, will not be here again. I will be hosting again. And I have invited Alice Smith. If you look at Extension's Facebook page or my Facebook page, you will see where Alice, who is a master gardener volunteer, as well as the president of the Native Plant Society, where she's talking about the native specifically the ground covers um, in front of the extension office here in Hernando County. She um, is uh, largely responsible for the new gardens in front of their office, which are 100% native. So I want you to save up all your native plant questions <laughs> um, so we can discuss them with Alice Smith next week. Just a list of my upcoming classes. Um, as you can see, Jim, I'm busy, busy, busy. Try to get a class out a week. And um, if you have any, if you have an interest in a rain barrel or a compost bin, and you live in Hernando County, email me. I'll give you the details. Here's Dr. Lester's email. And since he's not here for two weeks, I want you to continue to send him the very hard questions at his <laughs> email. Um, there's my email, Lily B at HernandoCounty.us. And Mr. Mall's email, um, specifically also if you're listening from Pasco or you just want to say hi, I enjoyed your you or um, and your presence there or have any questions. A lot of times what happens behind the scenes is I rely on my smart friends like Dr. Lester, like Jim, like several that I know, uh, BJ from Citrus County, um, several of them. So if you email me a question I don't know the answer to, chances are it's going to make the rounds among these people so you get a good answer. Also, today is Thursday. Do you remember in Fernando County what Thursdays mean at Extension Office, Jim? The weekend was about ready to start. <laughs> I don't remember. what. Who is our Master Gardener on Thursdays on the telephone? Oh, uh, uh, Bernie, who yes. was... Uh, like clockwork, and yes. I and he still is. So yes, he's um, there right now. <laughs> he, he's so, very de dedicated and, yes. and a, a wonderful, wonderful um, resource to to talk to about mm -hmm. your plant questions and other gardening situations. He's been doing this for about fifteen years. Since or so. yes, yeah, he's over still, fifteen years. He yeah. was in the best master gardener training class ever. All the ones I did in Hernando were the best. Uh, I happen to take that particular class <laughs> as well. Bernie's really knowledgeable, so give him a call there, 352-754-4433. Ask him the hard questions as well. Okay. And, and he knows the answer to yes, he really does. out there questions because he's experienced it for so long and 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 delves into the that because he has a great uh, thirst for more knowledge, as do most of our master gardeners, especially those that uh, do phone duty. You yeah. know, when they get something odd, they really start to research it more and more. What I love about master gardeners is you'll never um, see one of them answer you like, I don't know. Their answer will be, I don't know. I've got to find that out. <laughs> you know, they're just naturally curious people. So now that I'm back and I can see the comments again, yes, Diana, I'm sorry. I don't know what's happening with with Facebook, um, uh, but we'll be able to share this on Facebook so people can catch it later. Um, uh, do you see Gardener Donna here, Jim? She's asking about banana plants. I warned you there would be South Florida fruit questions. Um, do you have to feed them chop and drop to get a, to get a crop? And she's a poet. <laughs> um, not quite sure of the question. Um, sometimes they may be nutrient deficient and definitely will grow faster if they get some regular fertility. Uh, there is fact sheet at UF on, on fertilizing bananas in the landscape. And I'll be honest, it, it, 
is written for those who are into banana production and not the fact you have two or three or six plants and trying to find that fertilizer for just one plant, uh, in my opinion, is, you know, a waste of your time and money. You know, a general all-purpose fertilizer would be sufficient for fertility. Now, the, the mother plant, after she flowers and produces bananas, she will die. So those babies are what uh, you you will cultivate for the next crop. Um, and I think that may be the, the, the chop and drop, you know, the idea is mean, um, returning yeah, the, that's, you know, the nutrients a, um, back. Right, it, you cut it up, prune it and let it fall, I think is, she'll have to explain a little further, but I think that's what chop and drop would be, you know, just cut it all up, let it fall to, to provide nutrients for the other plants. It definitely is composting in place. It's recycling some of those nutrients right back to the plant. You know, it won't hurt if you can get away with that in your subdivision. Where I live in Brooksville, I can get away with that. And where Lily lives, you can get away with that. But in some of these HOA communities, uh, that may not fly very well with, mm -hmm. uh, with it looking kind of messy. But Yeah, in fact, I just did that. Um, it may not be the right time of year, but... They were bothering me. I had some, just some ornamental grasses. Um, I know most people kept those back, like in the winter. But um, my front garden was getting a little too crowded. So I gave them a really good haircut. And I just let the, um, the grass lay down like straw, like a mulch. And you know, there, there may be places that that's, you can't get away with that. But again, I guess that's what I did. I chopped and dropped, you know, so... Yeah, you know, it's kind of a shame that people rake up leaves and whatnot, throw them into a big old plastic garbage bag, put it on the corner to be hauled to the landfill, and then go to the box store and buy mulch. It, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Especially if you live in an area with a lot of big trees, you know, free mulch, you know, grass won't grow under the large oaks. Uh so make it a self-mulching bed where, you know, the turf won't grow and put in some shade-loving other plants instead. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, we, We've talked about that a long... You used to have... Um, in, uh, blah. <laughs> you know what I'm getting at? The St. Francis was at it and God were talking. Yeah, we used to go over that in Master Gardener training where, you know, God is questioning what's happening down there. You know, what are they you know doing with this crop <laughs> and you know he crop he explains how they just grow it to cut it to harvest it to throw it away <laughs> you know and i sometimes drive around and think what are archaeologists in the future when they study us they're really only going to come to one conclusion about us and turf and that's that we worship it because <laughs> We spend so much of our time and energy and money on it and don't really receive anything back from it. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting concept there, you know. It's not a crop that we consume. <laughs> it's really Yeah, we put a lot of energy in, in into it, but you know, there there are practical uses of turf. We're not saying don't grow Absolutely. turf where it's practical. Yeah. Um yeah. I live in Brooksville, and, yes, and I'm, the area. Yeah. I have semi-shade clay soil, and you don't have to water it, you don't have to spray it, you don't have to fertilize it. It's stupid easy to grow. Right, right. Put that in, place. put in full sun, sandy soil, it's a much higher maintenance turf. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, so. and I, I just sent you a picture recently of Right Plant, Right Place, of a beautiful stand of St. Augustine. You remember, like a week or so ago, I sent that to you. Gorgeous stand of St. Augustine. Of course, it's July. Maybe it didn't look like that in May. It wasn't fertilized. It was node high. It's not watered. But again, it's in interior Brooksville, kind of, you know, near um, the college, near PHCC area. Very moist <laughs> area. So... That all goes back to right plant, right place. That's why, you know, there are some people who say, why why doesn't Florida-friendly landscaping come out and say turf is bad? Because what's our number one principle? 
right plant, right place. It's not bad, but it's many times not the right plant in the right place. And that's where our conundrum comes in. You know? One of the master gardeners here in Pasco said this, and I'll give this bit of bone mo. Uh, she said, uh, frame it with turf. Don't farm it. There you go. That's, that's it perfectly, yes. Frame it, don't farm it. Well, and I went, it. That's a really good way to, to to think about it. And she was a very much a native plant enthusiast, but has practical turf framing her yard. Sure. And there are some instances where you may be like, I just want something that I just go out and mow and don't have to do anything else to, you know, like a garden bed or something. And, you know, maybe that makes your life easier too. We have nothing against turf. It is the overuse of too many resources to make a plant grow where it doesn't want to grow that's you know. well and i've said this many times publicly and i'll say it here you know uh don't blame the plant for wasting water fertilizer pesticides plants don't do that right yep and it's I, not the I plant's have, fault i have said you know in a lot of my classes too that i have yet to see any turf you know, crawl its way into a garage and turn on the irrigation system. <laughs> yeah. So, you yes. know, we, we need to point the finger where it needs to be pointed, That's is right. what we're trying to say, you know. Yep. And uh, Donna says yes to fertilize with, um, with other or its own passing leaves and such. Yep, composting in place is another way to put that. And um, that's the way it's done in the forest. You do have to be careful if you have, you know, diseased plants or anything. You want to remove that material so it doesn't pass along the problem. So, right, or if, like the peppers that are just kind of overwhelmed with white fly, don't don't keep that around. Destroy it. Right. Don't even use it in your compost pile. No. Yes, we're going to have this evening um, uh, a a virtual rain barrel workshop and compost bin workshop. And we discuss that all the time. Dr. Lester will teach the compost bin portion and he says that all the time. You don't wanna put um, invasive plants or diseased plants in your compost pile to show up and become a problem later. Um, in case you're wondering, how does a virtual rain <laughs> barrel and compost um, workshop work well you take the workshop in the evening and the next day you come by here and pick up the item that that's that's how we're working it um we do have a few openings this evening compost bins are free for hernando county residents only one bin per household they are a uh they're provided by hernando county solid waste the rain barrels are fifty dollars if you are a resident, no, I'm sorry, if you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, for your first rain barrel, you'll get a $25 credit on your water bill. Um, but you can't just buy them. They're not just rain barrel um, sellers. You have to attend the educational workshop. We have them every month. I'm having in-person rain barrel workshops at Shinsegat Conservation Center once a month as well as these virtual evening classes. So the easiest way to find out the, all that info and how to pay and all that, again, I will put my email in the chat, RamandoCounty.us. Dr. Lester always complains my email is too long. <laughs> there it is. Um, that is the really the only way to start um, signing up for one of those uh, it looks like I'm Dr. Lester today, but there's <laughs> my email in the chat. Um, and that's how you um, find out about our upcoming rain barrel or compost bin classes. How often do you have them in uh, PESCO, Jim? About once a quarter. I, I no longer do them because I have segued from being FFL program manager to master gardener volunteer program manager so about, about once a quarter and um, they we do it in different locations uh, our best way to find out of our all of our upcoming classes easiest way 
Google is your friend, uh, just type in to Google or Bing, uh, Pasco County Extension, and then Eventbrite. But Eventbrite is E V E N T B R I T E. I had to think about it. There's no G. Yeah. But uh, once you get there, it'll pop up what's coming up. And we have a bunch of classes starting in August that will be in person and uh, throughout the county. Some nice. of them will be in our libraries, community center, so on. You're, you're going out into the community. Yeah. So um, we're returning. We're, we're keeping capacity reduced in the rooms. Mm -hmm. And you got to pre-register. So right. you go to Eventbrite. Most of our classes are free unless you get what I call a consumable, not that you eat it, but, you know, we have to buy it and give it to you. And it was, you know, we had to pay Your for it. The, um, classes are just for Pasco County residents, correct? Ideally, but we've had people cross the border because we sell them cheaper than you do. I've had people cross the border because I provide the classes more often than you do. So. Can't make everybody happy. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, um, you don't have to be a Hernando County resident to receive a rain barrel from us or to purchase a rain barrel from us. Um, but the compost bins, because it's solid waste division, gives us away for free. You do have to be a uh, Hernando County resident and only one per household. Um, it's a very successful program. Yeah, our people are always excited about it. I've actually had people over the years come up from Pinellas um, taking our classes simply because they want it then. And, you know, Pinellas might not be offering it right then. So, well, we've had it where they buy, we restrict it to one rain barrel per session, uh, partially as several years ago in another county. Somebody, came to a rain barrel workshop, bought a whole bunch of them, like 10, mm -hmm. oh. and then was found reselling them at a flea market oh. at many times the price. So we restricted it to one. Now in Pasco, if you want to have a second rain barrel, you can come to another workshop, but you pay your, your money, but you're going to have to sit through my spiel if I'm teaching or whoever. That is exactly the way our rules are too. As I tell people, um, I need a body per barrel. You know, if a couple comes, they can buy two rain barrels. Only one gets that rebate if you're a customer. Um, but I've had, I have one couple who eventually bought 10 rain barrels. They wanted it all the way around their house and they came to five <laughs> workshops. Got to listen to me each time. <laughs> so, but I also tell them, you know, a body per barrel, you want to bring your whole family, go ahead. As long as that body's over five, and they're listening, I'll count it, you know, that you can purchase a rain barrel for the person who listened, you know, to our uh, instructions and our education. So, and it is fun doing it up at Chinsiget. That's that's my venture out into in-person. It's in-person, but outside. It's nine in the morning, it's in the woods. So it's, by the time I'm wrapping up around 10, it's like, okay, let's go in now, but <laughs> or get in the car or something. But it's kind of pleasant out there under, it's in their pole barn. You've been out there. And, yep. Uh, oh, it's a beautiful drive out there if you haven't been. And it's a great place to walk around. Some wonderful wildlife, mm -hmm. um, you know, woodpeckers, bats, you name it. Um, just the insects that are, you know, flying around like, damselflies and other yeah. beneficials and uh yeah and they're they're having programs out there they're doing moth walks dr lester will be out there saturday doing an insect walk um, of some sort so you can look them up chinsiget conservation center that is not the manor house they are near each other but not in the same place the Conservation Center is at 23212 Lake Lindsay Road. See, pretty good there, huh? That's real good. I couldn't remember the, the address, but Lake Lindsay Road. Mm -hmm. So if you go to the manor house up on a tall hill, you're in the wrong place. Unless 
see a beautiful therapy. white house no that's not the right place visit there but that's not where we have the rain barrel workshops and um, people have gone to the wrong place quite often they have the same name so it's at one time it was all the same property but they're about a mile away from each other i would say as the crow flies yes but yeah. you kind of have to go here and there to get to it yeah in a beautiful area of hernando county oh it's it's definitely a good drive out into the country mm -hmm. you know go 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 to inverness for you know up 41 and some very beautiful yeah, if you're going through the of, forest and that is yeah. uh, where Chinsegan is located is in the Wiflifuji forest. You know, That's when that. people say you can't grow plants in Florida, just go out that way and you it's green yeah. and lush and no one is watering it and caring for it. Again, exactly. the right plant went into the right place by mother nature. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, some are weeds, but that's another topic for another time, I suppose. Well, with our, with our time that we still have, um, we you did kind of touch on that now wasn't a great time to be growing those peppers in our area. What about vegetables in general right now in midsummer? If they're not, they have to already be in uh, by now, but you can plant some things in, in May that might make it through the summer, like okra, sweet potatoes, black-eyed peas, um they're coming up yeah with other ones uh, there's a yeah. I'm, th there's a couple other things but by like and the, large like calabasa pumpkins or something like the, that. the seminal pumpkins yeah. will but they had to be started before the rainy season really got a toehold you know we don't grow a lot of veggies during our summer months it's just hot and, and rainy and they just turn into a pile of goo or they're stressed and you know they're an insect magnet now i know some people do get peppers and all growing through the summer others don't and when that happens to you just you know move mm -hmm. on and replant we're not going to plant more warm season vegetables to about the first part of september and that's kind of still the rainy season but usually the rainy season is starting to wind down by the second or third week of september so that's not a very long time to endure the heavy rains so but if we wait too long like october november especially yeah, in the cooler pockets yeah. especially in the cooler pockets of pasco and hernando county you can get you can get a frost now people laugh at me we haven't had one in a long time but uh, it can happen around thanksgiving it's been sure. years uh, but usually we get the first one in in the area about uh, you know between thanksgiving and christmas mm -hmm. uh, the last few years it's been later and we're not getting them till past christmas into maybe the first part of january so that's extended our season but that's not a guarantee and if you you have a crop that's cold sensitive and it, and it's not uh, you know that productive at that point you'll probably lose it on a cold night so that's why our timing window is very very precise and if you miss it uh, it, it just is heartache and pain yep it's not the same as up north oh gosh no um <laughs> you know you you can't plant your tomatoes on memorial day weekend like i did growing up in Milwaukee and then uh, hope and pray you didn't get a frost after you planted them and then grow them in the summer uh, tomato season ends Father's Day is a good way to remember mm -hmm. it's done at Father's Day so if you don't have any tomatoes on in June beginning you're not going to get anything I have um, I'm growing accidentally your favorite vegetable <laughs> but I'm growing cucumber out of, yeah. out of my compost pile. I have a compost pile right next to my compost bin. But I also, it's growing there on its own, but I don't expect it to come to fruition because of the time of year. Um, oh, we'll yeah. Insects, diseases, um, many other things are going to go wrong probably with that. Speaking of other things we see at this time of year, uh, right now is this is a, the turf grass season where all the problems are really showing up in, in yards and people are misdiagnosing what they have. 
we get a lot of brown spot questions starting sometime in June when the rainy season starts up and they keep going till the end of the rainy season. The neighbor will tell you it's chinch bugs. By the time we're having the heavy driving rains, it's unlikely to be chinch bugs because they're driven off the, the leaves of the plant from the heavy rains and they don't like wet weather. They like hot, dry. Most of the time people are dealing with diseases and putting out insecticides, which will do no good. Mm -hmm. So right now it's knowing what is causing the brown spot or what caused the brown spot. Sometimes what caused it may have been months ago and it's done. A um, lot of misdiagnosis. So bring it hit, to your you extension office. That. Yeah. Speaking of misdiagnosis, you hit on that. Your neighbor <laughs> will tell you it's chinch bugs. Now we're seeing a whole lot of uh, community Facebook groups that people decide to ask horticultural questions. And Dr. Lester and I get a big kick out of reading some of the answers. Yeah, I've heard, I don't keep up with that, but, um, you know, these forums, uh, Dave's Garden, things like that, Facebook, and or others. Even if it's a gardener, yeah, that at least you'll get maybe halfway decent answer. This is, you know, like just you know, Spring Hill group or something like that, where they ask any question you can think of, where's a good dentist or whatever. And then they come up with, what do I do about my lawn? And yeah. I, I call those opinion sites, you know, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're your opinion of who does a good job of painting a house to dentistry to, you know, what's wrong with my lawn. And, you know, a lot of these people are really not in the know or knowledgeable enough about, the problem with turf yet they're telling you to put various crazy things out there some of which aren't legal you know out in the yard mothballs is a classic example of people throwing stuff in their yard to get rid of wildlife if it's not legal they're toxic they're only meant to be in an enclosed uh, container indoors um, and they don't work at repelling things anyhow so it's a lose 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 um remember years ago who um someone came in asked you a question and told you but my barber said for 20 minutes everything i told him he said but my barber told me but my barber told me and i had kind of you know a time crunch starting here to go somewhere and i was getting a little frustrated and he wasn't listening and it was you know what's the point mm -hmm. and out of somewhat of frustration i just stopped and said sir i promise i won't cut your hair if you'll just listen to me <laughs> yes. and that kind of you know rebooted him you mm -hmm. know it's like what who what well, we all have our strengths yes you came um, to the right place you came to the experts now let's hear what the experts have to say and it's not just that you and Dr. Lester, you know, are ultra smart, which you are, but <laughs> you are. But you, you also don't spout your opinion. You spout research-based um, information, studied, vetted from our land-grant university in Florida for Florida, you know, uh, conditions, conditions, soils, all that. You know, um, even research done in some of the deep uh, southern states may not always apply, you know, when they have clay soil. Right. Um, you know, there's climate similar in Hawaii, but they have beautiful volcanic soil. Right. Uh, so um, it's different. Even mm -hmm. even Puerto Rico, yeah, which can have yeah. some climate like us in Florida, um, they have volcanic soil, too. And it's a, it's a whole different world. So. You know, these are for Florida conditions, which there's really probably the only other place close uh, to our climate in Florida is probably that Galveston, Texas area. Yeah, I think maybe Louisiana. And maybe parts of Louisiana right near the coast, yeah. but very little. So that's why all those gardening books, if you schlepped them from the north, they're useless. They're good doorstops, um, but you know they just don't apply. And even some of the, the gardening books for the deep south start to fail as you come down the peninsula, as the conditions change from clay soil of the panhandle, where they do get 
a little more reliable cool down. They mm -hmm. get a second rainy season in the winter that we don't quite get on the peninsula. And uh, so their conditions are, are, are different uh, there, it's but the garden yeah. and, and the gardening books start to fail the further south you come on the peninsula and and it's a big state. I, what is it? 700 miles from from the Keys up to the Georgia border, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, but it's, it's big. Yeah. So and, and it, yeah. And people created boundaries, you know, for political reasons and, and named states. If, you know, if the plants were in charge or the animals were in charge, I'm sure it would be totally different. So there's, you know, different like areas panhandles nothing like miami you know and central florida we're kind of stuck here in the middle and you can't you know grow peaches very well like they can up further north because we don't have the chilling hours but nor can we grow you know royal ponciana or you know the great tropical plants so it, it narrows down the plant palette because those that need the chill don't get enough of it here and those that can't stand the chill can't make it here so that plant palette really gets squeezed to far fewer choices mm -hmm. and that's because of we're right at a tension zone between subtropical tropical and like i said if you get into tropicals one bad night is all it takes for for this to to be killed in many many cases and a lot of people who have moved here within i'd say even the past 10 years They've not seen a cold spell no, yet. No, no, no. And you and I have experienced um, cold fronts that would routinely kill St. Augustine lawns. Been a um, while, but yes. We haven't seen that probably 16 years or so, but it used to happen. And it could still happen, you know. I I don't think those days are completely over. I think the, the, the interim between them is, you know, further than it yeah. was. 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. I mean, they used to have terrible freezes in Florida in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And by yeah. 1989, yes. by 1989, that was one of the last of the big freezes of Florida, mm -hmm. you know, of the big ones. And that's 32 years ago. So I say this, Americans have rotten memories. <laughs> We forget yeah, sure, yeah. that these things happen, and you know, we do get occasional cold fronts that are devastating. Um, to even St. Augustine, which has some cold hardiness, but you know, middle teens or middle twenties, excuse me, and you leave your um, your uh, irrigation system running, you're going to kill it. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll yeah, talk no, about. And also, don't freak out and think just because your turf turns that straw colored that you just mentioned in the winter that it's dead no that is a natural way of dealing with being semi-dormant because of the shorter daylight hours i'm trying to teach people to love their golden winter lawns yeah and don't think adding water and fertilizer in the winter is going to turn it green it won't you're just wasting money and water and if in case you're wondering why is my grass green under the snow up north but it turns straw colored here well that's the difference between a cool season grass and a warm season grass and what do we grow most of the southeast i would say grows a warm season grass when i travel north on the roads in the winter all the grass is that golden colored through virginia really so and just to say this, there is no perfect grass. They all have their pros and cons. Um, some are easier to maintain without irrigation, like Bahia, um, common Bermuda, uh, but they need a lot of sunlight. Uh, you have semi-shade, well, your options are more toward the St. Augustine, but that's kind of higher maintenance. Um, different insects, different diseases. Uh, you've got to pick your battle. Uh, and if you go to the store and see some miraculous product trying to claim that it'll go from 110 degrees down to 40 below, and it has the word Canada at the top, it ain't going to grow here. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. I, I've mm -hmm. seen people try to buy these miracle grass seeds, you know, on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, they're looking, what can I grow in, 
and most of the time, first of all, our warm season grasses to grow it from seed, the vast majority of people have done it in my almost 22 years of experience have failed. Yeah. Um, the, we get a heavy rain, the seed all washes away. It takes about four to six weeks for germination. And Best time. A whole lot of weeds in that time frame. And up. weeds come up. I've only had a handful of people say, yeah, I managed to get a good lawn out of it. Very few. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time they spent a couple hundred dollars on seed. It failed. Then they came back in and said, what do I do? And I'm like, buy sod. Right. Yeah. yeah. And St. Augustine, there is no seed for it. And right. They, and sometimes people think that's some kind of conspiracy. <laughs> well, St. Augustine in the hybridization process is essentially a mule of right. the plant world. So it has to be propagated asexually. Essentially, those stolons or runners are cuttings, if you want to think of it that way. The cutting is horizontal rather than upright, but uh, same idea. Mm -hmm. If it's just there is no seed for it, it's not, yeah, it, it's cloned, you know. Yeah, Floratam is a clone, mm -hmm. and it is genetically identical to every other Floratam lawn. Um, cloning has its pros and cons too. You get uniformity, there's a pro. The con is if the whole subdivision has one genetically identical plant planted, you know, corner to corner, front to back. Mother Nature does not like monocultures very right. well. Mm -hmm. nope. and we were, yeah, Bill and I were discussing that in the class we gave on Tuesday. And I say that all the time. Diversity, diversity is the key to any healthy ecosystem. Yeah, and mm -hmm. we can talk about palms, you know, or other trees and shrubs. You know, if you plant all, put all your eggs in one basket, kind of setting yourself up. Mm-hmm. Yep, well, we're running out of time. Um, if anyone has any last-minute questions, now's the time to to throw it in there. I guess they're just, just hypnotized by our knowledge. <laughs> yes. yes, hypnotized. <laughs> yes, and Jim is not in the witness protection uh, program, just so you know, he doesn't have very good lighting there <laughs> in his office. He claims he's uh, purposefully hiding from us, <laughs> but... And thank you, Linda. Thank you for joining us. Um, Linda's one of our regulars as well. Hi there, Linda. I don't know the regulars, so. Yes. All right. Well, do you have any last-minute words of wisdom for us? Uh, less is best, and when in doubt, don't. You know, don't yeah. start throwing stuff at it when you don't know what's wrong. Exactly. You know, and go to the right place. That's what you're doing here. We know you know. You know, but tell your neighbors go to the right place. Find your local extension office. Um, go if you're doing any research online, which you know, who knows what you'll find. Um, so always put UF after what you're searching for for University of Florida, and look for those publications that were that are research based from our land grant university. So. And just the less is best. I see people putting more on and more <laughs> yeah. on and more on mm -hmm. and more on to their landscape plants. And I call those people Lily. Oh, so yes, morons. Yes, you made me say it. <laughs> and they need to learn their less ons ah, oh you added to your your stick there <laughs> okay so le less is best and when in doubt don't okay i think with that that's a good way to end this and thank you lee and brenda and linda and donna and everyone who joined us and again i apologize thank you. I tried to get on through facebook the tech just didn't work today so all right thank you very much and have a great week i'll be here next week with Master Gardener, native plant expert, <clears throat> Alice Smith. Thank you, Jim. You're welcome. Been fun.